Okay, so we are going to get started here with the Maps for Research webinar. This webinar is going to focus on basic introduction to Google Maps and using them in your classroom. So for the first roughly half hour, we are going to talk about basic functionality of Google Maps, assuming really no background on your part. And then in the second half of this webinar, we are going to delve into how to create your own content on Google Maps using the My Maps tool. So let's get started. First, let's talk about the different ways that you can arrive at Google Maps. Um, starting off, there is a URL that we can use, so it's just maps.google.com, and that will take you straight to the Google Maps interface. Other ways you can get there from the Google homepage, you can come up to the very top up here where you see different things like web, images, videos, and maps, and just click on the map, Maps button right here, and that will also take you to Maps. Also, if you are ever in doubt about how to find any sort of Google tool, you can always use Google as a search term. So just typing in Google Maps, that will actually be the first suggestion that comes up, and you can cut right to Google Maps by using a search. So let's get oriented to what is actually on the Google Maps page. Up here, this is the query bar, where you will be entering in different ways to search the map or find locations on the map. Over here we have a slider where you can hide this left-hand panel to get a bigger view of your map or slide it back out in order to have it return to you. These are going to be the navigational tools over here so you can toggle around the map. We'll get back to there a little bit later after we zero in on a location. And finally over here, this is our layers interface. We'll be delving into layers again after we zoom in on a particular location, but this is going to allow you different ways and different views to see your map. So let's get started by zeroing in on a location. One way we can do that is by setting our default location. Right now we don't have one set at all. Your default location, if you load one into Google while you are signed in, is going to marry you to a particular position. That means every time you log into Google Maps, Google will assume that you are searching from that destination, and it will give you search results that are tailored to your area. So let's set our location for where we are right now, which is the Google office in Mountain View and that's going to come up as one of our suggestions. We'll zoom right there. If you ever want to change your default location, you can just come up here and enter in a new one or remove it completely. Let's try going somewhere a little bit more exciting. We can go up the bay to the San Francisco area. And here we are. From here, we can try to explore some of the layers that we have. So coming over here, we can view traffic in this area, and I can zoom in a little bit to see how that goes. In this traffic area, you'll notice that green areas are going to indicate places where traffic is moving at a relatively decent clip. The yellow areas are going to be areas where traffic is slow, and these red areas are going to say that there is some sort of issue. Now, in the San Francisco area, it doesn't look too bad, but let's say we tried to find a more congested area. In Los Angeles, there's quite a bit going on on this traffic map, lots of different icons. So I'll talk a little bit about those. For example, this exclamation point over here is going to say that there is some sort of incident in this area. This icon over here is going to say that there is actually an accident. So this is going to be a traffic collision and thankfully no injuries. This icon is going to indicate some sort of construction. It appears that there is bridge maintenance in this area. And finally, the kind of angry red do not enter sign is going to indicate that a road is closed. So that is going to be the traffic layer. If you ever want to get rid of a layer, you can just come over here to where it is and uncheck this checkbox, and that layer will go away. Let's try the next layer. Here we've got one that's called Photos. This is going to show you different photos that people have uploaded that are specific to this region or this area. So I'm just going to come through a couple of these. Many of these pictures are going to be tourist pictures or pictures of the surrounding area. So lots of different views, pictures of buildings that have been uploaded by our users. The terrain tool is going to allow you to see the actual lay of the land in Los Angeles. Let's get rid of the photos layer so we can see a better view of that. 
We are going to zoom out just a bit to get a better idea of what the terrain looks like. This is something that can be used especially in science classrooms if you are studying earth science or terrain. A great way to see kind of a topological map, if you will. Let's try a different layer here. The Wikipedia layer is going to give you a way to explore the area based on the Wikipedia articles that are tied to that area. So let's turn that one on. You're going to see that your map is going to auto-populate with lots of different Wikipedia stubs. So let's try mousing over some of those. Again, many of these are going to be specific to the location, and many will be about places, buildings that are in the location that you're zeroed in on. If you ever want to get to the actual Wikipedia article, there is going to be a link at the bottom to get you to the full article if you want to find out more. Other layers that we can explore. Let's get rid of the Wikipedia and terrain ones for now. Bicycling maps, unfortunately not available all over the world, but in many places in the US, are going to be useful for people who take bike paths pretty much of anywhere. In Los Angeles, it's really not that developed, but let's go back to San Francisco, where people seem to take their bikes all over the place. Let's zoom in just a little bit and see what some of these maps look like. Here you'll notice there are three different kinds of bike paths that you will see on Google Maps. These dark green lines up here are going to indicate where there are bike paths that do not allow motor vehicles on the road. So only bike paths, only for bicyclists, pedestrian paths as well. These lighter green paths are going to indicate roads that have bike lanes, but also allow motor traffic. And finally, these dotted green lines are going to indicate roads that do not have bike lanes, but are recommended for travel for bicyclists. So they are bicycle friendly, but don't have the actual lane. Let's uncheck this one so we can get rid of that layer. Now let's talk about navigating through our map. Our navigational tools are right up here. We have up, down, right, and left. And we also have zooming capabilities. So let's experiment with those very quickly. If you want to pan up on your map, simply click on this up arrow. If you want to pan down or to either side. Now this might be a bit cumbersome for some people. If you prefer to just use your mouse, you can actually just use the drag and drop model. So hold down with your cursor on any area of the map, just press down as I am now, and just drag to go in any direction you want to go. This is going to allow you a bit more control and flexibility over how you pan your map. If you are a keyboard user, you can also use the up, down, and over keys in order to toggle through your map as well. Right now, without the use of my mouse, I am toggling with my keyboard. So three different ways that you can change the direction or pan of your map. Now let's talk about zooming very quickly. This bar over here is our zoom bar, which is going to allow you to zoom in on a location or zoom out to see more of the map. So let's zoom out for a second. That's going to give you a broader view of the San Francisco area. And to zoom in, just click on this plus sign. You can also zoom on a particular area. Let's say I want to zoom in on this intersection right here. I just double click. And it will take me right to that intersection. Also, if you are a trackpad user, you can choose to zoom by brushing up to zoom in or brushing down to zoom out. Precision is not quite so easy doing here. It's a bit of a science and it requires a bit of practice. But if you are a trackpad user, you are able to zoom that way as well. Some final things to get you oriented. If you ever want to reset your map or go back to the beginning, just come up here to where the Google Maps, map, uh, excuse me, Google Maps logo is and click on that once. And it will clear your entire query and set you back to a place where you can start again. If you ever want to get back to the web from Maps, just come up here to where it says web and it will take you back to the Google home page. So let's get back to Maps and see what we can do from here. So let's talk about the different kinds of things that you can find with Google Maps. We already know through searching for San Francisco, Mountain View, and Los Angeles that you can search for a city name. 
but you can also search for the name of a place. So let's try searching for White House. It turns out that this is the first result, and it zooms us straight to this location. To find out more about the place, just click on this little balloon that comes up. We call this the marker in Google Maps lingo. And it will bring up more information. For example, this photograph, the address, reviews, and the official website for the White House. Let's try searching for some other places just by name. For example, we can try looking for the Empire State Building. And that will take us there as well. We can also search for places that aren't necessarily buildings, but that we know the name of anyway. For example, we can try looking for Yosemite. And it will take us straight to Yosemite National Park. Let's see what kind of cool layers we can find for Yosemite. We can see the terrain, if we so please. And we can also change out of map view to see a satellite view of what Yosemite National Park looks like from the sky. If you ever want to go back to map view, just click up here where it says map. And that will give you a cleaner, more road-oriented version. If you want to search for a particular landmark or landmass, Google Maps also supports some of those as well. For example, let's say you were looking for Devil's Tower. It'll zoom you right there as well. Also kind of a fun thing to see through satellite. And again, most people know that you can search just by the name of a city or place. So for example, maybe we want to go to Dallas. Oops. Here we go. The first time around, it will actually autocorrect. We can also try searching for the place where I ended up going to undergrad, which is Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And it will zoom us right there. That's my school right there. As a matter of fact, you can click on these things, even if you haven't searched for them specifically, but find them on the map, just by clicking on the name, and the info bubble will come up for that as well. I can click all over this map and find out different information about different places that I didn't necessarily know were there. You can also search for a place just if you know the intersection. So not even the address, but just the cross street. For example, I happen to know this cross street. That's in Honolulu, Hawaii. Let's see a map view here. That's going to give me this intersection, even though I didn't know the address. We can also just search for a regular old address if we have one. Here's an address that I know very, very well. This is the Coventry area in Cleveland Heights, where I grew up. If you want to take a better look at it, what you have over here is actually a snapshot of Street View. Clicking on that, it'll take you right to the Street View of the Coventry area in Cleveland. Let's take a little look around. Yep, pretty much how I remember it. Over here on the left-hand side, you'll see lots of different options for at this address. You'll notice there are four different businesses listed at that address. As it turns out, all four of those places share a building and have different suite numbers. So even if you know the address but don't necessarily know what's there, Google Maps will automatically tell you what you can find at that location. In order to get out of Street View, you can simply click this X box right at the top right of this window. So let's get out of Street View for a second. The last thing that Google Maps supports is latitude and longitude. In order to get there, you simply right-click or control-click on the marker and click down to what's here. Again, that would be a right-click or a control-click on the marker and then go down to what's here. Up here, you will notice that the query bar automatically populates with the latitude and longitude of this area. You can also search by latitude and longitude, even though I don't know any off the top of my head. We can just change these to fly out to somewhere else on our map. While that is loading, latitude and longitude for Google Maps unfortunately does not support the degrees, minutes, and seconds mode, but does need to be converted to decimal mode.
So if you are going to be entering in west or south, that needs to be predicated by a minus sign. And the north, south, east, west directions are separated by a comma. If you would like help converting from one to the other, we actually have a helpful link to convert from degree mode to decimal mode that our panelists can send out to you if you so desire. It sounds like we're actually going to put that in chat. And it also appears that the uh, latitude and longitude that I entered in is in the middle of the ocean, but of course, only so much of our Earth can be populated by land. Okay. So now that we know the sorts of things that we can find in Google Maps, let's go to probably the first functionality that most people use Google Maps for, namely finding directions. So let's go back to where I was before and try to find directions from one place to the other. Seeing as I'm sitting here in the Google office in Mountain View, I think for a nice vacation, I'd like to go to Disneyland. So let's go back to Google for a second. Here we are, home sweet home. Again, you're going to see a picture of Google over here, a little snippet that tells you the address and some reviews. It looks like a lot of people have written reviews about us. So let's try to get directions from here to Disneyland. There are a couple of ways to do that from here. You can click on the get directions bar right at the top. You can also click on directions in the search results on the left hand side, or you can come over to the marker, click on it once, and click on the directions option that comes up. Let's just click on that one. You will notice that the directions bar automatically comes up on the left and that it will auto-populate with a blank spot on top because it's assuming that I am going to Google at the end. But I'm actually starting from Google and I want to go somewhere else. In order to flip-flop these, I come over to this little hook sign for get reverse directions and click on it once. That way I'm going to start at Google and I'm going to end up going somewhere else. So where do I want to go? I want to go to Disneyland. So let's get directions. We can either press the return key to make that happen or just click this button down here. And Google has automatically driven out a route for me. So it sounds like it's going to take about six and a half hours to get down there. I'm going to take I-5. Okay. Let's step through the directions down here. You'll notice that on the map, this blue line is my actual route to get from point A all the way to point B, which is the Disneyland Resort. And you'll notice as I am dragging my mouse down through the directions on the left-hand side, on the right on the map, it is actually thumbing through all these directions and when they are changing path. So I'm going to keep doing that. And notice how those keep updating on the map. Okay, now for those of you who have been to California or ever driven on California roads, uh, you must know that the drive down I-5 is one of the most depressing drives that a person can ever take. And it just looks like Google wants me to spend how long on I-5? Oh, that's awful. Almost 300 miles. I don't know that I can take that much. So what I can actually do if I am unhappy with this route is modify it. I can just come over here and put my cursor on the route itself, and where it says drag to change route, I will do just that. So I'm going to press down with my cursor here, and I'm going to just drag this line over to the 101. A much prettier drive, and it doesn't take that much more time. And I don't actually ever want to go back to the 5, so I'm going to drag it from this area as well and come down to the 101. Now it looks like my trip's going to take about 45 minutes more, and look at this. I'm going to get to see all of this ocean and not have to deal with the depressingness of I-5. You'll notice that my directions automatically updated when I dragged my route to be changed. And if I ever decide that my modifications are too much or I want to go back to the original directions proposed by Google, I just go up here to where it says remove all. And that will snap back to I-5. Okay. Now let's assume that I actually have a friend in San Diego, and I would like to take him with me to Disneyland because it's much better to go to Disneyland with a friend. So in order to add a destination to my trip, I come under here on my directions bar on the left-hand side and click Add Destination, and I'm going to add San Diego. 
it's actually going to come up as a suggestion because Google knows that I am searching within California and is going to auto-populate with California cities. And I'm going to click Get Directions to update my directions. Okay, so let's see what Google has put together for me. Well, unfortunately, now Google is telling me I'm going to Disneyland first and then I'm going to San Diego. But what I want is to go to San Diego first and then go to Disneyland with both of us in my car. In order to do that, I need to reorganize my directions and put them in a different order. But you'll notice that the switchy thing that we used before when we only had two directions is now gone and has been replaced by A, B, and C. It turns out I can actually shuffle these just by picking them up and moving them. So I'm going to pick up the C by depressing my cursor, and now I can move San Diego to any point in my trip. So I'm going to put that one in the middle to tell Google that I want to go to San Diego first and then go to Disneyland. We're going to let that update itself. Okay, so now it's going to take me about nine and a half hours to get down to San Diego and come back to Disneyland. That's not too bad. And again, if I want to change my route to go back to the 101, I can just pick up my route and drag it over. Now it looks like it's going to take a little bit longer, but it's totally, totally worth it. Okay, let's talk about some options that we can employ when we are trying to find directions. So next to Add Destination, there are a couple of options that you can also pick. So let's open those up by clicking Show Options. One thing we can try to do here is to avoid highways. Now for a long trip like this, I probably wouldn't recommend avoiding highways because you're going to be on lots of country roads for a long time. But maybe you're driving in Los Angeles and you don't necessarily want to get on the freeway and want to find some thoroughways to take you where you want to go. In that case, select the Avoid Highways button and then Update by clicking Get Directions. Now Google Maps is telling me it's going to take almost 20 hours to get to San Diego and then to Disneyland, avoiding all major highways. And look at all of these different roads I have to get on. No major freeways here. I probably wouldn't recommend that for this sort of trip. Also, if you're traveling in an area that has lots of tolls, fortunately not on this particular trip, you can similarly click the Avoid Tolls button, and it will steer you clear of places where you need to pay to use the road. Lastly, if you'd rather see your directions in kilometers instead of miles, just click the KM button, and everything here will be updated to show you your driving directions in kilometers instead. So let's unclick all of these, go back to miles, and hide our options. The last couple of options I can show you for get directions are the options right up here. So we have an image of a car, a bus, a walking person, and a bicycle. And you probably guessed correctly, these are different modes of getting to places where you want to go. Google Maps is going to automatically assume that you want driving directions. But maybe you want to get down to Disneyland by public transit. Just click on this button. And Google Maps will tell you different buses and trains you can take to get to your location. Again, you can click on any of these to get more information about where your bus is leaving from, how long you can expect to be there, and where your next stop will be. You can actually click the Previous and Next button in order to toggle through what all of your stops are. And at the very bottom here of these directions, you will find links to all of the providers of bus and train services on this trip. If you want to find out more information, perhaps more up to date about scheduling and fares. So we provide that information as well. Now let's see what happens when we click on this walker over here. Okay, it looks like Google is now telling me it's going to take about eight days to walk to San Diego and then back to Disneyland. That's probably a little bit more intense than I want. Although I will point out over here a rather curious indentation of this trip. You might wonder what's going on over there. Let's see if we can get all the way down there by toggling through. You can see where my mouse is going if you look on the map portion over on the right. And I am going to keep toggling down until I find out what is going on over there. So let's keep going down. Oops. Okay. And finally, we have a different icon over on the left over here that looks curiously like a fairy because that's exactly what it is. As it turns out, 
Google Maps is going to assume that taking the ferry also fits in with your walking plan. And taking the ferry in this case is going to be a little bit faster than trying to walk from point A to point B. So your legs can take a little bit of a rest while you take a boat ride to and from Avalon. Okay. And then the very last, which you have already seen a preview of, is going to be bicycling directions. And the further in you zoom here, let's just zoom in on this location a little bit more. Oh, I have zoomed in too far. We'll come back. Mm -mm. Oh, I am all the way out. It is so sad. Here we go. If we zoom all the way in here, we should be able to see the bicycle map itself coming to life. Unfortunately, it looks like in this location, bicycling maps are not supported. Oh, it is so sad. Google teams are working furiously to try to get bicycling directions in every area, but they're really only supported in places where people do bike to work. So in this case, it looks like you're just driving, or bicycling, I should say, on a regular normal road. But if you were in San Francisco, these roads would be colored either green, dark green, or dotted to indicate that this is a path traveled by bikes, not traveled by cars, or possibly one with a bike lane. Okay, so now that we have figured out how to get from one destination to another, another thing that people often use Google Maps for is Street View. So let's take a look at that. You've already seen a preview of Street View when I showed you the Coventry area in Cleveland where I grew up. But Street View is probably a little bit more useful when you're dealing with places that it's unlikely you will ever see in real life. Let's say, for example, Paris. Let's say I know that there's a bookstore in Paris that I have always heard of that sells English language books, and I'd like to see what the outside of it looks like. I happen to know that the name of that bookstore is Shakespeare and Company. And I know that it's in Paris, France. So let's try to find that. Google Maps is going to take me right here. I'm going to find this snippet that gives me the address and phone number and a bunch of reviews. Apparently someone thinks this is the best place in Paris for English books. I can believe that. In order to see Street View, there are a couple of things I can do. I can click on Street View under the More button that comes right under the search results. I can also click on the marker here and click under More, and Street View will also become an option. So let's just click on Street View here. And Google Maps is going to dump me right in front of this bookstore. This is Shakespeare and Company, and we are in Paris, France. So let's take a look around. In Street View, you can also navigate using these buttons to pan yourself either way. You can also just use this reappearing and disappearing gray circle to navigate your way through the street. So here I'm just going to click once where the circle appears in order to advance through Paris. And I can turn myself and maybe walk in this direction and maybe walk over here. It turns out I am actually right across the street from Notre Dame. And here there are different pictures that users have uploaded to this map of Notre Dame. I can zoom in on those as well. In order to pop out of this photo view, again, I can just X out. And in order to exit Street View, I can X out of here as well. Let's see if I can find some other places in Paris to look at. For example, I know the Eiffel Tower happens to be here. While that is loading, I don't necessarily need to zoom to Street View using the query results or the marker. I can also just use this little guy over here, which is our Street View Explorer. So let's zoom in on this area first, and I will show you how that works. In order to zoom, just click on this marker, go under More, and go to Zoom here. We'll wait for that to load. Okay. Now you will notice here that Street View is actually not supported, which might lead you to believe that there is no way to see the Eiffel Tower from the ground. Fortunately, we can use this guy 
to drag and drop to places that we don't necessarily know the address for. So just to press your cursor over this guy over here, our Street View Explorer, and drag him out into the road. All of the areas that you see in blue are areas that are supported by Street View. So let's dump him over here and see what happens. And it looks like we are right in front of the Eiffel Tower, even though it appeared that there was no street view for it at all. In the same way, we can toggle our view. And using this gray box, or circle, excuse me, that appears on the bottom, I can toggle my way through the street. So this is kind of a cool way that you can explore different cities that you might never be able to go to just by using street view on Google Maps. Maybe you have seen our Street View cars motoring around your neighborhood, taking pictures of things. As it turns out, the Google Street team has photographed pretty much all of the inhabited world. So there are many things that you can see never having to leave your classroom. OK, so now that we have explored basically how to find directions, use Street View, and locate different places on a map, we are going to segue into the My Maps portion of this webinar. So if there are any questions about the first half, please let us know by contacting the panelists or contacting all participants. And again, we will try to hold some time at the end for questions about really anything that you have on this webinar as well. So let's clear out what we have here. Again, we can reset just by clicking the Google Maps icon in the top left. And let's explore making our own maps. In order to make your own maps, you're going to be using the My Maps portion. You're going to find that on the top left-hand panel. So let's just click open on that link. In order to use My Maps, you're going to need to be signed into a Google account. Here I am signed into my Search Educators account. If you do not currently have an account, just follow along. But in order to use the My Maps function, you are going to need your own account. The reason for that is that it's assumed that when you make a map, you're going to want to access it later. And in order to store it in the cloud, we need to know that it's you, so you can open it from any machine. So let's get started by pressing this button. In order to make a new map, you're just going to make a title for your map and enter a, descri a description. So maybe I'm teaching a history lesson on historic Cleveland, which is where I grew up, and I want to call my lesson, the Historic Cleveland Lesson. And this is going to be a short tour of notable landmarks in the downtown Cleveland area. I can choose to make my map public, which means that anyone can see it, or I can make the map unlisted, which means only people that I explicitly share the URL for this map are going to be able to find and activate this map. For the sake of this, let's just make my map unlisted. I'm going to save that and click Done. Right now, my map is kind of boring because there's nothing in it, but let's start populating it with things. So, for example, I know that one notable historic landmark in Cleveland is something called the Old Stone Church. It's a beautiful old church in downtown Cleveland that has recently been annexed by a school district. Um, but really one of those nice old-style organ-type places, um, really nice velvety chairs. So let's try to zoom in on that. And here we are. There's a picture of the Old Stone Church. So maybe I want to add this to my map. So under here, I'm just going to see the Save To link. I'm going to wait for that to open. And it is going to prompt me with different maps that I have created in my maps and ask me which one I would like to save Old Stone Church to. All right, looks like our server is having a bit of a hang up, but here we are. So it's going to ask me which map do I want to save to. Right now I only have one, or I could create a new one, but I want to save it to Historic Cleveland. So I'm going to do that. And now it's going to ask me if I want to view my map at the top. I do, just to make sure that it's there. And what do you know? Old Stone Church has automatically populated itself on my historic Cleveland map. Let's add a few more locations to my map. For example, there's a structure downtown called Tower City, which is a place where people can shop and see movies. There's really a nice fountain on the inside that's surrounded by kites. So let's find that if we can. 
All right, and it's going to take me right there. This is kind of a depressing exterior picture of that. We'll see what we can do about that when we go in to edit our own map. Here, I can save this map again to the map that I have created. We're going to wait for that to open. All right, it's going to ask me which map I would like to save to. I'd like to save that to Historic Cleveland as well. So let's do that. View the map to make sure that it took. And here we go. Now I have Old Stone Church and Tower City on this map. Let's add one more place. I happen to know there's a really cool castle-like structure in downtown Cleveland called Gray's Armory. So I'm just going to search for Armory. And I don't even have to type in three or four letters before it automatically auto-populates. Google Maps knows that I am now searching for places in downtown Cleveland, so it's going to suggest places that sound like what I want based on past searches. So let's go right there. Here we go, Gray's Armory, kind of an intimidating castle structure. And again, I'm going to want to save that to my historic Cleveland map. We're going to wait for that to come up and save. So let's go back to our map. I now have Old Stone Church, Tower City, and Gray's Armory on my map. Now what I want to do is go in and actually edit this map. So I'm going to click the Edit button that appears on the left-hand side. Now, part of the reason that you would make a My Map rather than just using a regular old Google Map is the editing capabilities that are here. So, for example, you will notice this bubble has popped up with information about Gray's Armory that is asking me to add a description, maybe edit the rich text, or edit HTML. So, maybe I would like to put in an actual description of Gray's Armory. I can say it's a castle-like structure. I can say the Cleveland Orchestra used to perform here. And I can click OK. Now my description actually comes up on the left-hand side when I'm viewing my map. And once I say that I am done and go in and view this, my comments will appear here as well. Now let's say I wanted to add a photograph to one of these images, excuse me, to one of these locations. So I was complaining earlier that the image that auto-populated on Tower City was kind of gloomy, and here Google Maps isn't even giving me any images for Tower City. So I want to put in one of my own. Again, I'm going to click the Edit button here, and I'm going to go to Tower City. Now I want to go to Rich Text in order to add an image. Oh, I'm going to let that reload. Hmm, it seems to be, oh, here we go. We're having some slow server issues today. So under rich text, a couple of different options are going to be provided to you. Any text that you put in here, we're just going to say, this is text. I can make it bold face if I so choose. I can underline it. I can change the font. I can have a little bit of fun playing around here. But one of the cool tools that I can use in rich text is I can insert an image. Here it's going to ask me for a URL. That means I need to find an image to put in here. So let's find an image of Tower City. I'm going to open up a new window, and I'm going to search for Tower City Cleveland using Google. And I'm just going to go under Images. I can find that up here, or I can find it in the left-hand panel. Ah, and here we go. This is the fountain with the kite. Perfect picture. I'm going to click on that, wait for that to open. Oh. While that is loading, I am going to copy the URL of this image once I find it and put it into the My Map so that the image will auto-populate the next time that I view this button. It looks like this is having a bit of trouble loading. We'll just try this one more time. Oh, here we go. All right. In order to copy this image, I'm just going to right-click or control-click here. I'm going to copy the image URL. And let's go back to our map and add the image. Again, I'm going to click on the insert image picture, paste in the URL of the image, and you will see that this window automatically populates with the image, the URL of which I have pasted in. So let's click OK, say saved and then done, and click on the Tower City bubble. And now check it out. The picture that I've put in is now in the Tower City bubble. Oh, 
Okay, um, so we do have a question from chat about whether or not you can, you can upload an image from your computer. This is an excellent question. At the moment, Google Maps only supports images that are currently hosted on a website. As it turns out, there are lots of different places that you can host images for free. You can even email an image to yourself and link to the URL that is generated by your email if you so choose. There are also sites like Picasa or Flickr, which are going to allow you to do free hosting of images. So if you have images that are on your hard drive or on your personal computer, all you need to do is find a free service that will host your images online and then paste those URLs in if you please. Um, many different sites to do this. If you would like some from us, we can send those out to you. We can email those to you if you choose. Just let us know in chat if you want keys to doing that and we will let you know how to host those images online. Okay, so we're just going to talk about a few more capabilities that you can do in here. So I already talked about adding in a picture, but maybe I want to add in a video. So for example, for Gray's Armory, I happen to know that there's a really cool tour video of the inside of Gray's Armory, and I want to put it in here. So let's just go find that first. I can go to YouTube, and I can search for Gray's Armory Cleveland and see what comes up. This is the video that I was talking about. It's by Insider Perks, and it kind of gives a uh, inside view of what the armory looks like. So in order to embed this video in my maps, I'm going to go down to YouTube where it says embed underneath the video to get the video embed code. I'm just going to select all and copy this and come back into my map to edit that bubble. So again, I'm going to click the edit button I'm going to go down to Gray's Armory. And now instead of opening up rich text, which is where I added in a photograph, I'm actually going to edit the actual HTML. So here I'm going to paste in my video link and I'm going to click OK. And that is going to automatically populate with the video. So let's see if that has come in. All right. And now when I open up this bu bubble, it is going to automatically let me play this video right inside of the place marker bubble. Okay. So let's back out of here. If I can scroll out. We'll just open up a different window. Okay. So one of the really nice things about being able to edit these bubbles is that you can edit them in ways that might seem a little bit different from how Google Maps would do it. This is particularly useful if you are leading a class on this material. So let's see how that might work out. So for example, let's go back to Old Stone Church. What I can actually do here if I am leading a class is I can get rid of some of these optional details and put in different details. So for example, these place details are automatically populated by Google Maps, but maybe I want to get rid of those and not overwhelm my kids with that much information. I can go into edit, and I can actually say, hide these place details, so they won't come up in my bubble. And maybe I'm writing some sort of quiz or scavenger hunt on Old Stone Church. And rather than putting in information here, I want to say something like, question one. When was I built? Now this becomes a quiz question that my students can actually use in the classroom. I can just click done here. And now this becomes an interactive quiz that kids can use on a map. I can also choose to just completely populate the bubble with my own information that I have either created, taken from a textbook, or that my own kids have written. So maybe I am going to challenge my kids to write up a description of Tower City. And maybe in front of this picture here, I'm going to say, this is a description of this landmark written by my students. And I'm going to save that. And that is going to come up instead. OK. So this has been kind of a general introduction to how to make a map using points that you have taken from regular old Google Maps. But right here, we have dealt with all places that Google Maps recognizes. So I searched Google Maps for Old Stone Church, and I searched for Tower City and Gray's Armory and it recognizes those places existed. But maybe I want to build a map with places that Google Maps doesn't necessarily know about. So let's talk a bit about how to do that. 
maybe I want to make a map that includes a place in uh, the Chagrin Valley, which is also in Cleveland where I grew up, called Squire's Castle. And I want to search Google Maps for that. So I know that it's in Cleveland, Ohio, and we're going to try to find it. It turns out that Google doesn't actually know where Squire's Castle is. You can see that it's coming up in bold on these snippets over here, but there isn't actually a place marker itself for Squire's Castle. Now, I know that Squire's Castle happens to be in the North Chagrin Reservation, so let's just click on that to get a zoom view. In order to zoom all the way in, again, I go under More and go to Zoom here. And here we are at the North Chagrin Reservation. Now, I happen to know exactly where Squire's Castle is, and it's right here where my cursor is. But Google Maps hasn't yet figured out where it is. What I can do if I'm making a My Map is actually create new places that Google doesn't recognize. So let's try doing that right now. Again, I'm going to go into My Maps to create a map, and I'm going to click on Create New Map. Maybe I want to call this one A Day in the Park by the castle. And the description might be a walk around Squire's Castle and lunch at the picnic area. And we're going to make this one unlisted as well. I'm going to click Save and Done. Now again, my map is sort of boring, so I'm going to start populating it with things. In order to do that, I'm going to click this Edit Bubble, and different editor tools are going to come up on the top. So I'm going to draw your attention to those. Right now, we just have the hand selector, which is allowing me to move my cursor around and explore this area. But there is also the create a marker or create a place mark button, which I'm going to be using right now to add Squire's Castle to this map. So I know that Squire's Castle is right over here, so I'm going to click with my cursor to create a place marker for it. And here it is. I can add in a short description of what I'm talking about. This happens to be a haunted castle in the Chagrin Valley. And maybe I want to add in a picture over here. So again, I'm going to open up a new tab. I'm going to search for Squire's Castle, Cleveland. And I'm going to restrict by images. Let's find a good picture of it. Ooh, I happen to like this picture a lot. Let's click on that one, see if it will load. Okay, again, I'm going to copy this URL here, go back to my map, and in order to add an image here, I'm going to go under rich text, click on the add an image, and paste in my URL. And that is going to put an image of Squire's Castle right in here. I don't so much like that my text is coming underneath the picture. So I'm going to cut that and put it at the top. I'm going to say OK, save, and done. And now when I click here, my description is here, my picture is here, and as a matter of fact, this entire marker is here where there wasn't one before. Let's add in a couple other places on this map. Again, I'm going to click Edit, and I'm going to select my marker tool. I happen to know that across the way there's this nice picnic area. So I'm going to drop that over here. This is where we'll have lunch. Okay. And maybe I don't so much like that these are both the same kind of marker. I can actually change those if I come up here and on the top right there is going to be the marker icon. If I click on that, I can add different kinds of icons. So let's find one that's a little bit more picnic-y. I happen to like this one over here. And I'll say OK. OK, let's add one more place to our map. I happen to know that there's a really good playground just in this area over here. But rather than adding a place marker, maybe I want to stencil out that the area is bigger than just one place. So instead, oh. I've panned all the way up. I'm going to use the draw a shape tool to indicate the full spread of the playground area. So let's go down here under the line tool to where it says draw a shape. Now I'm going to click to start drawing how big the playground area is. Oh, 
I'm going to say this is the playground area. I'm going to say it's a huge field. There are swings. Super exciting time. And if I come up here, I can actually click to edit this line, maybe change the fill color if I want it to be yellow instead. So I have a couple more places on my map. So let's just click Saved and Done and take a look at what we have so far. Right now we have Squire's Castle with a picture that I have uploaded. We have the picnic area without a picture, sadly, but I could put one in there if I wanted. I could also add in a video that I have uploaded to YouTube about the last time we were at this picnic area and had so much fun. And I also have the playground area where we're going to go play on the swings after lunch. So maybe the next thing I want to do is add in some information about how to get from one place to the other. Again, to edit anything, I'm going to click on this edit bubble. And to draw a path from one place to the next, I'm going to click on this line tool yet again and click draw a line. So here I'm going to try to draw a line connecting Squire's Castle to the picnic area so I know where to walk. So I'm going to click to start drawing a line here and pan up to the picnic area. It's not such a line. Not too far away at all. I'm going to say short walk to the picnic area. And again, I can also change the color of this line if I so choose. And we'll talk about what snapped roads means in just a moment. Here, the short walk to the picnic area is going to populate over here. And once I click done, once I mouse over, it's going to tell me exactly how many feet I'm looking at. So this isn't going to be too much of a walk for anyone. Let's try drawing one more line. Again, I'm going to click Edit to make any changes. And maybe I want to do one more line connecting this general area to the playground area so people know how to get there. So let's draw one more line. I'm going to start around here, sort of in the middle of the picnic area and squares, and I'm going to connect it to the playground area. Now this time, when I go in and edit, I'm going to want to snap to roads. Now I'm going to check that box, and you will see that Google has automatically modified my line, so I'm using this road. It's assuming that I'm going to be walking down that road or down the sidewalk, rather than bushwhacking through all of these trees. Let's change the line color to make it different from our first line that we have made, and say OK. And let's give our line a name. This is going to be the walk to the playground. And I will say OK. Over here on the left hand side, because this is a line that has automatically snapped to roads, Google Maps is going to tell me exactly how far it is and about how long it would take if I was driving. I'm not driving, of course, I'm walking, but it's nice to know that it's under a mile. So let's just click Saved and Done here. And this is my starter map. The last thing that I can show you guys here is the use of the star tool in maps. So maybe, for example, all of these places that I've just put on the maps are places that you can't find on Google Maps. So if I want to tell a bunch of people to meet me at Squire's Castle, they're probably not going to know exactly where that is. And I want to tell them to go to some place that they can find on Google Maps where we can all rendezvous and get ready for our big day at the park. In order to find places that are around this general area, I'm just going to use the star command. So I'm going to put in an asterisk in the query box and just press return. Now Google Maps is going to tell me all sorts of places that are around this area where I can tell people to meet up. And after this finishes loading, you'll notice that these places are going to come up and populate with these markers on this map. Uh, it seems to still be loading. Let's just try this one more time and see if it will come up. Okay. Looks like it's still not auto-populating. We're going to try this one more time. Okay. Google Maps is just having a sick day towards the end. Always, always. But if you want to use the star tool, all you need to do is select some place on the map or even just zoom in on it, as I have here. Click in an asterisk, and it will give you lots of different places that Google Maps recognizes that are in the general vicinity. 
when Google Maps finishes loading, ostensibly, those places will actually come up and pop up using the marker tools. And here they are, just as I was about to give up. So these are a number of places where I can tell people to actually meet up with me because Google Maps is going to recognize them when they try to do a search. Let's try to find a good one. There's a studio here, maybe not so great. What's this one over here? Ah, the elementary school. I know that everyone knows where that elementary school is and it's just up the road. I'll tell people to go here and then they can meet me at Squire's Castle for a day in the park. Okay. So it looks like we've got about a minute or two left in this webinar, which is not a whole lot of time to answer questions, but if there are any quick ones that you want to fire off to us in chat, please let us know. Additionally, if you have lingering questions after this webinar, Tasha and I are going to be going through our email and responding to any questions that you have. So if you continue to have questions about Google Maps that you would like us to answer, send email to tbm at google.com. That is for Tasha Burks and Michelson. And we will get back to you with a response within the next two days. Um, again, if you have any questions whatsoever about maps or this webinar or any of the topics that we have covered, please send us email at tbm at google.com. Okay, it sounds like Tasha would like to answer a couple of questions on her own, so I'm going to hand over mic capabilities to her and let her fire that away. So forgive a little interference while I transfer the headset. Tasha is going to answer a couple of questions on copyright. Hi, um, so just very quickly, rather than scribbling long notes to Trent about this, I thought um, I, we got some questions about using copyrighted images to drop into your maps. Um, and of course, I'm not going to give you legal advice regarding copyright because I'm not a lawyer, but I will say um, that it certainly occurred to me um, that when, when you're using a web document, you want to be, a, um, of course, mindful of the laws surrounding um, the pictures you use. One way you can do that um, is if you go to Google Images, um, Google Image Search, you can actually go to the Advanced Image Search, which you will see um, right over here where the yellow cursor is showing. I click on Advanced Image Search, and one of the options I have, let me turn on the annotating tool so I can mark it for you, um, is right here, this usage rights. Um, usage rights allows you to search for images that are under Creative Commons. And um, so when you click on this drop-down box, you can pick whether something's good for reuse, for commercial reuse, which if you're in a classroom, generally speaking, um, copyright law, you're not under commercial use. Um, and you can see these other options. If I do a search, uh, let's say label for reuse, and um, let's say I was looking for, what was the name of the castle? Squire's Castle. Squire's Castle, which of course I can't spell, so hopefully I'll get any spell check. Um, here are images that are labeled for reuse of Squire's Castle. They may not be um, exactly as lovely as what Trent found, but that is one way that uh, you can show your students to be careful. Um, it's actually a great time to have a quick talk, talk about copyright and about Creative Commons. Um, do we have any other questions coming in? Um, okay, so I'm going to hand back to Trent. Thank you for your patience, and she's going to answer the next question. All right, thank you so much, Tasha. She is the expert on these things. No, not a lawyer. So I thought I would <laughs> let her run with that. Um, but I did want to wrap up just a bit of what I'm talking about in Google Maps and give you some links to additional resources if you would like to find out how to use Google Maps in your classroom. So a couple last lingering things here before I actually leave this page. Some things that people have brought up just on the question stream. So let's go back into this map very, very quickly. And I will show you some sharing and collaboration capabilities that you can use in your classroom. So for example, when we first made this map, there was the question of whether you wanted this to be public or just an unlisted map that people had to find by linking to it. If you're curious about how to find this map by linking to it, 
you can come over to the top right hand side where it says link with the little picture of the chain link here and click that. That is going to give you a link to this map that you can share with anyone. That means anyone on any account on any machine can open up this link and see the map that you have created. Additionally, if you have a class website or a website of your own, you can paste in this HTML to embed your map in the website. You can also send the link to people directly by using the send function. That is going to bring up a dialog box that is going to have the link embedded in the message, sent from you at whatever account you are using through Google Maps, and you can specify who you would like to send that to. We'll just click cancel here. The very last thing that I want to show you is this collaboration tool. So similar to being able to just email your map to people, you can invite people to be able to edit the map with you as well. So if you invite people as collaborators and share this map, you can say that your collaborators are allowed to edit the map, and perhaps that your collaborators are allowed to invite other people to edit the map as well. So if you were a teacher in a classroom, you could potentially invite all of your students to collaborate on the map or maybe specify that only you are allowed to see the map and they are not allowed to tamper with it but can use it if you share the link. So whichever possibility you would like to choose. Okay, finally I want to take you through a couple of links that are going to provide additional resources if you would like to use Google Maps in your classroom. So the very first one is just Google Maps support, which is going to be found at maps.google.com slash support. You can also just do a Google search for Google Maps help, and this will be the first thing that comes up. So this page is going to walk you through different tutorials and advice about many of the things that I have shown you today. So if you ever want to come back here for reference about how to find directions, how to use Street View, or how to use My Maps, this is the place to go. Another place that is tailored specifically for educators is the Google for Educators site. You can find this just by typing in Maps for Educators, Google Maps for Educators, or Educators Google Maps into your search query bar on Google. This is a fantastic resource for finding different ways that school teachers have used Google Maps in their classrooms. For example, I like this part down here where it says, here are some ideas for using Google Maps in your classroom. So there are different applications from art to earth science to history. I'll just open up one of these to show you an example of something that you might be able to do with Google Maps. I know many of you have probably taught California missions at some time, so I'm going to open up that map that was created by a Google educator. And here, using the markers that we have talked about, this is an educator who has actually populated all of these bubbles with their own information about all of the missions in California. So this is an example of one application that you could use Google Maps for. Again, the main site for that is going to be Google for Educators. The URL is up here, but it's probably easier to just search Google Educators Maps in some combination in your query bar. And that's going to take you right here. Another place that you can go um, is the Google Maps Mani site, which is actually focused on Google Mashups. So Google Maps Mashups are something that people with a little bit more programming and developing experience can use to go in and hack on Google Maps. So this is something that you may have heard of. It might be a bit too advanced to use with your students because it does require some programming background. But people have done some really wonderful things with, with Mashups, and it might be something worth exploring. So for example, um, just some of the ones that are off the top here, locating power plants on a map, 45 degree imagery on a map, aerial view. Um, I especially like the American Civil War map that they have created here. And again, um, these are just mashups that people have created using the functionality of Google Maps and making them do new and important and cool things. I've seen mashups for being able to find temperatures, across the globe for being able to find population across the globe. These are the sorts of things that perhaps if the kids in your class have a bit more programming experience, you might be able to use in your classroom. The last link that I want to show to you is actually the blog by a uh, user experience developer um, working out of, I believe, New York City, which just gives even more examples of how to use Google Maps and Google Earth in the classroom. Google Lit Trips is one that I will give a particular call out to. It has been used very successfully by a number of teachers that we are in touch with, and it is a way to bring literature to life using Google Maps and specifically Google Earth, 
which is an extension of the Google Maps that you can download from the Google Maps page. But there are examples here for literature, biology, physics, the list literally goes on and on. Okay, so it unfortunately appears that we are mostly over time. Um, so I'm going to be closing out this webinar shortly. Um, again, as a reminder, if you have any lingering questions, we are more than happy to field them. Please send them to us at tbm at google.com. That is T as in Trevor, B as in Brat, and M as in machinery at google.com. And we will get back to you as quickly as possible with your answer. Um, we will also email you all of the links that I have just showed you for more resources to everyone after this webinar is closed. Oh, excuse me. When the archive is up, we will additionally post links to that site as well. So if you come back to where we post this webinar archive, um, the links that I have shown for additional resources will be posted there as well. Or if you would prefer to have them today, just shoot us an email and we will get those to you as well. Um, as a reminder, once this webinar is over, you will automatically see on your screen a link to a survey. It would be so, so helpful if you could fill that out for us. That is going to help give us feedback and help make these webinars even more useful in the future. Um, and as a final note, I believe that the next webinar in this webinar series will be offered next month. It will be led by our very own Tasha, who is going to be giving a webinar on how to visualize your search results. So stay tuned for information about that. Um, please fill out our survey once you are prompted to do so. And again, thank you so much for attending this webinar. This has been Maps for Research presented to you by Google. And thank you so much for attending.